Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, and as maybe you heard earlier, I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Design, the online architecture and design magazine. And we have a fantastic panel here today. We have Alexander Lervik, who's a designer. We have Lee Pomp, who I'm sure you all know from the TV, right? A, a broadcaster. And we have Peter Torna <laughs> from a Swedish design company that has the longest name of any design company. I've... I thought I remembered it earlier, but do you want to tell me the name of your company again? Scarpa Collective Forma. <laughs> Eight <laughs> syllables, yeah. I think I counted it was earlier. <laughs> okay, we're here to discuss the line between art and design. Um, are the two, different, the two disciplines completely separate? Uh, are they coming together? It's the third time we've done a talk with Aritko. Um, and they're always in very, very interesting locations and have very, very interesting outcomes. Anyway, each of the panelists is going to give a short introduction about who they are and their thoughts about the topic, and then we'll have a discussion. And at the end, there will be time for some questions. So, Alexander, first of all, over to you. Well, thank you. I start. Uh, and I have this uh, exhibition here in the museum uh, that's about the theme, the line between art and design. And uh, for me, it's a way of trying to see if I can sometimes go over that line and create art, and if I keep, what happens if I stay on my side of the line and, and make design. So. Uh, I start to show this one, the, my brain lamp. Uh, it's an old piece from 2007. Uh, in this case, I scanned my head in an MR scanner and made a lamp out of it, because I 3D printed it, an uh, exact copy of my own brain, uh, and uh, released that. It was in 2007. But um, <coughs> then, the reason uh, I'm here in the panel is uh, because I'm one of the, or the designer for the Aritko lifts. So I started, to, uh, I won a competition uh, in 2013 uh, about doing the world's first uh, home lift uh, and created from a blank sheet of pipe, uh, paper a completely new lift. Uh, and uh, now it's time for the second version that uh, is released also in the furniture fair this week, uh, the one for commercial use. Uh, and in the museum I have made 12 objects uh, where I found the inspiration from different art fields. So. <coughs> the chair you see now is uh, inspired by the minimalistic art, uh, and I created an easy chair with a three-dimensional pattern. <coughs> this cupboard we see here is inspired by the graffiti art, uh, and I did this really like a tag under the, like the frame is a tag, made in bended wood. Uh, and as a contrast of that, I wanted to create a more minimalistic feeling of the top part. And this chair uh, I uh, have turned upside down of the production line in the furniture industry and made one chair thousand factories. Uh, so it will be local production all over the world. And uh, to explain really shortly, it's, uh, I had a TED talk in 2009 about the future of 3D printing and had a thesis that we uh, as a designer and producer will end up in the same situation as the musicians did in the late 90s, that people start downloading our products and print them uh, without we getting paid for it. So. Uh, uh, my last part of that lecture was that we need to start Spotify for the design business before instead of after. So now we start this. So uh, if you buy the chair online, you will, uh, and you live in New York, it will be made in New York. If you live in Mexico, it will be made in Mexico, and so on. So, but, and we also give it away for free on the internet. So. When you started out uh, your creative journey, your career, you studied at um, uh, the school uh, Beckman's, Beckman's Design of School. Yeah. Uh, school of Design. Yeah. Did you know that you wanted to do design and not art, or did you spend a bit of time exploring both of them? And did you th think there was any difference between those two things when you were when you were young? 
like <clears throat> when I grow up, my mother is a sculptor and my father is an engineer. So I used to say that I w became to end up in the middle. But uh, I started as a designer. But then after a while, I'm, I might have got bored and started to jump over the line. So. Mm. Okay, so uh, a sculptor mother and an engineer father. Yeah. So what were those um, dinner table conversations like between the two of them? <coughs> they divorced before I... <laughs> 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 that would have been a really good point to end the discussion on. <laughs> Lee, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my parents are also divorced. My, mad <laughs> my mother, she's a painter, and, yeah. and my father was a management consultant. So that's, so, yeah. that's, <laughs> kind of so that's, that's how that ended. Yeah. Uh, now, um, I guess I'm, I'm recognized maybe to most people uh, like um, as a host or a, as in like a role like yours, Marcus. Um, I'm, I've been hosting for nearly 10 years a show, a very nerdy uh, talk show on antiques on, on Swedish public service uh, TV. And it's a, it's a show where we like dig into history and we discuss very narrow subjects such as uh, one single material, it could, it could be brass, or uh, one single artist, or um, a movement. Or, and and uh, for me, it's that, that is pure joy, actually, to dig into history in order to maybe also understand our current time, and also understand uh, the dilemmas or the questions that designers of today uh, are, are hit by. So that is what I've been doing a lot. But uh, my background is actually an, as an art historian, and I was um, starting my career uh, uh, on the two largest auction houses of Sweden, Bukowski's and Stockholm Sexualsverk, where I ended up being a curator in the design department. And um, then I started to join, well, I joined one of my, my clients, a dealer, um, and this is from the dealer Modernity stand at the TFAF. Uh, that is the world's most exclusive uh, antiques fair. It's in Maastricht in uh, Holland every year. And in this booth, you see the pieces that I was you know, hanging out with for like 10 or 15 years. So-called design classics. Um, furniture by Kåre Klint or in this case, Paul Kjærholm and, and uh, um, some of these very famous Paul Henningsen. Um, this, I was taught, was design, and nothing but design. Uh, useful things with a function that, well, they were beautiful, but they are design and not art. But then I started to, you know, think myself. <laughs> and um, also in, a, in an auction house, you, you get in contact with like, pieces like this one. This is uh, one of the other modernists. This is, this is a silversmith. He's a Swedish one called Viva Nilsson. And, um, well, this is a pot. This is uh, something that you can pour liquid in, and it works when you pour the liquid, if it's tea or water or coffee. Um, but when you look at it, and when you know that he was, you know, he discovered the divine geometry together with modernists, painters at the time in Berlin and Paris then and he comes back to Sweden and he creates this cubism in silver you can question whether this is a functional object whether this is design or whether this is something that you should maybe regard as art and in my case I stick with the idea that this is still design because it's a useful uh, thing that is created maybe not for a certain need or a, to solve a problem, um, but it's a, a useful design object with a beautiful shape. If I was still working in, in the auction house, this object will also come to my department as head of a design department. And this is a, a, well, an object called concrete. It's made of concrete. Um, and the artist, or the designer, as you wish, is called Jonas Bullin. And this was his um, examen work in 1981. And it can be viewed as a chair. It has a back, it has a, a seat, it has armrests, 
Um, but it's very cold to sit at. It's impossible to move. It's nothing uh, of what we call a functionalist uh, piece of furniture. And, you know, we also designed... The, the producer um, decided to, to let the artists or designers sign them and made a limited edition of 100 pieces. So this is a question of, is this design or is this art or is this um, something, something in between? And um, maybe you have the idea of that art is something defined by the, the uh, an idea of something. That art is something that should make people feel or react or make um, a comment on society, whatever. This is a piece that has all these that I was taught that art is. Uh, it doesn't have so much function. <coughs> but still, this piece appears on the design department when you sell it on the second-hand market. So that I find quite interesting, and I think that could be also fun to today's topic. Mm. As the head of the design department at an auction house, I guess one way of looking at the question is what is the difference between art and design is how much did the design sell for compared to the art? I mean we tend to think of art as being a lot more expensive. So is that the difference, a, a few zeros? Yeah, but I, I guess you, you have a point because um, we tend to, the market tend to pay more for that that is regarded as art. But maybe we have to redefine what is art and what is designed. And I don't know, is it even important anymore? Because uh, as we know, form, can also develop feelings and it could be a mark on society or can create anger or engagement or something. So maybe as the status of designers rise toward what the artists have been for hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe these definitions are not so um, important anymore. Better, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself then. Yes, thank you. So uh, my background is uh, in uh, product design, coming from uh, a way of working, with, engaging with the materials and how we perceive and experience materials. Uh, but at the same time, I kind of urged of uh, reach out uh, further and uh, put the design in a broader context. Uh, and I can uh, I can see in, in in the lens from where we're looking at now uh, that all of my products could. Uh, could be viewed as art, even if we never really intended to make them as, as art pieces. And uh, collaborations has always been very important for me. One of them were with, uh, with urban designer, called Joshua Morrison, and I'm a product designer. We kind of met somewhere between, end up working with uh, products in public space. Uh, on this example here you see is a, uh, it's called Windwall, uh, a public art installation. Uh, with moves in the wind, but it's made with a, a designer's uh, mindset in terms of the production, in injection molding, and very industrial processes. And also talk about collaborations. I think often design collaboration can be uh, two designers working together because they like like each other, and even maybe they went to the same school, or even same class, and they have the same same strength and the same weaknesses, and think the same way. And it's interesting to see what kind of collaboration can you do with, with two different professions. So one of these collaborations were with an uh, old childhood friend of mine, uh, Gustav Sermo, who is an uh, organization developer and working with human rights and democracy. And we said, OK, can we do something together using our competences? Uh, and uh, end up doing a pilot project of using craft and design as a platform for integration of youth coming to Sweden and basically building and making projects, uh, which is called uh, Skapa Kollektivet Forma. It was a platform for meetings, meetings with uh, people m uh, meeting craft and uh, materials, uh, young people coming to Sweden from uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Somalia, Iraq, and a lot of countries uh, meet different different parts of Sweden they couldn't reach, or didn't, didn't know exist in terms of going to exhibitions and other cultural institutions. Our, our biggest project is uh, what we call 17,000, because a few years ago, around 2015, 
uh, it was a big uh, crisis in uh, refugees coming from Afghanistan and uh, it was talked about uh, how many are going to get deported back uh, from Sweden to Afghanistan and in one uh, my newspaper it was a number of 17,000 was the estimation and we kind of that number gets stuck in our mind and uh, we thought a lot about it and how can how can we like, understand that number so then we thought like how can we show that with something that we make and we made this big installation that is contain 17,000 small unique uh, art pieces you can say assembled in a, in a great uh, in a huge installation that is made it is a artwork but it's clearly made with a designer's mindset in terms of okay when when we made it uh, how can we make something that is we can uh, transport it to different venues we can build it up in dif different configurations uh, there are this uh, this uh, 34 uh, oak frames each of them containing uh, five 500 small pieces and this uh, can be set up in different in different f configurations it can be a flat wall it can be a more three dimensional uh, shape and when it's also like also the life between exhibitions uh, how, how, how can we store it uh, and it was showed the first big exhibition we did was at Lily Wall's war salon and last uh, one year ago there's a lot of organizations working with after Afghanis rights but they could at that point they could never like really collaborate because they have slightly different uh, opinions how to work with the with the, the issue but then uh, they could unite and behind this work and kind of that, that could create a platform for them to, to meet. Okay, at least we can agree on this one, on this piece. And then the outside the exhi art exhibition, they made a, a flower installation where they started to put down a lot of flowers and make performances and, and, and come together. It's, uh, it's really amazing to see. I'm really pleased to say that the, the art piece have been bought by a foundation now called 17,000. Uh, which will continue work uh, in, in the ethos uh, of, of the of the piece. You said that you know that it is an artwork, or at least that, that it, it contains mm. artworks. <laughs> but you approached it with a, a designer's mindset, and then you talked about you know so it needed to be transportable, reconfigurable, whatever. Is that are you saying then that the artist mindset doesn't take those things into account? That the the artist might make something that was impossible to transport or deliberately make it as difficult as possible? Is, 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 is the artist not so concerned with practicalities? Is that one way of looking at the difference? Mm, could be, but not necessary, because there are loads of artists who are, I think, uh, like very practical and, and, and make things uh, in the same way as a designer makes. But it's more like, for, for me, uh, uh, I see it, okay, I can see how the designer's way of thinking really shines through. Uh, when we produced uh, and I made a process of making it happen. Do you have in your minds a definition of what art is and what design is? To my answer is that for me it's not really relevant if someone wants to classify themselves as an artist or a designer. Uh, but at, at the same time, sometimes how you read an object, if someone says it's design or if it's art, even if it's the same object, you, you read it completely different. And, and even if it's a good or bad, bad, uh, bad thing, uh, if, it's, if it's art or if it's a design, I would say. What about you, Alexander? Could you define what design is? Uh, in one way, no. Cause, uh, like art could be any, anything. You can do whatever uh, when you do art. But uh, if you look to design, I think the word function has a mean. And, uh, Behind here we have a chair uh, that I call a sculpture because of that I have changed the measurement in it so, and the proportions, so it's a shitty chair. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so it's a sculpture because it's you don't sit in it; you, it's you look at it, and um, uh, that's one way of thinking of it. But um, 
But it's uh, art because you decided that it is a piece of yeah, art. Yeah, I did that. It's but a shitty share, else can so yeah. it has to be something else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's a shitty share, but is it a shitty piece of art? Would you have accepted <laughs> it at your at your um, auction house? You think? Oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> As a homage at uh, Giacometti. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, but uh, I think it's something in there with the. Uh, when I work as a designer, uh, I need to look at things in a completely different way. And uh, because we are here, I can explain it through some of my objects. For example, the lamp standing over there. When I started to do it, uh, I made it without light, just like a sculpture uh, standing in full scale, <coughs> welded together. And it looked really, really nice as a piece of art. Uh, but then I wanted to do it as a lamp. And then the big work for me started because I needed to change the whole construction because of, I needed wiring through the whole lamp. And <coughs> because of that, it is a geometric shape. Uh, each pipe uh, meets the material in between each other only for 20 millimeters in width and five millimeters in height. And in there, I'm gonna put a lot of cables and a lot of uh, screws and everything to be able to produce it in mass production. So in the end, I had to invent this small part in between to be able to do that. So the producer could do it fast enough so that the price stays down. So, and that's what I call design in that matter, because uh, it needs to work for production. Actually, maybe we should have a, a checklist of, of things that we think are different between art and design. Yeah. So we've all mentioned function, three ticks for that. Uh -huh. Price, now we've talked about yeah. price. So <laughs> design is cheaper than art, yeah. that's one way of looking at it. Right. But not necessarily any, any, any longer. I think that'll, that is about to change, for sure. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> I mean that we, maybe we evaluate design uh, on a few more levels that, than we did before. before uh, if design is the answer to a problem that has to be solved, <clears throat> or uh, you know, a solution or a, a need that you want to meet, then it stays as a functional object. But I think that we have added uh, a lot more to, to, to uh, the term design since then. And since there are so many idea-based things in design, some design is actually inventions. Uh, and most of all, the artistic, you know, the shapes, the colors, uh, all that that comes with it makes us appreciate it more or uh, um, e more equal to, to art. And I think it's, it's uh, about the market maturing, actually, uh, in order to, to appreciate all these aspects of design and the combination of art and, and uh, artistic um, skills. So, so it, it happened a lot in the last 20 years. It will happen even more uh, in the coming 20 or 50. So I think we will, m my guess is that there will be a world of um, good uh, artistic objects or paintings or sculptures or functional things, but they will be all in, in one blend. That is uh, my guess. Actually, uh, that's reminded me that, that there's a third thing we can add to our checklist, and that's the, the label that you put on it. Because mm. if you say this is art, then it's art, and mm. if you say it's design, then it's design, and it can be the same. It can be the same thing. It's about mm. the intention of of the creator. But it's interesting you talked about this change over the last 20 years, and it's interesting to maybe take a longer historical perspective because in the last 20 years, since I've been a journalist, you have seen the rise of the collectible design market. Uh, whereby people, designers, are knowingly making objects that are kind of expensive and rare and have the kind of limited edition and the provenance and the, you know, the artist's proof and it kind of follows the model of the art market and then they sell them in fairs that are often attached to the design fairs. And there's an interesting um, thing on the text in the entrance uh -huh. to your exhibition, Alexander, which talks about how 
art and design were not even separated until, um, was it a, f a few centuries ago in France? Yeah. So how many, how, I don't know how good your art history is, panel, <laughs> but um, how has the difference between art and design changed if you go even further back in time? You, you never used the word design until what, 100 or maybe 100. Maybe William Morris was the first to express the word. But I guess it's, it's uh, even in the post-war period of the 20th century that we really, really use it, this word. It was like Charles Eames, who was maybe the first known designer. He was, uh, you know, he was making this um, uh, plywood uh, leg uh, supportive for the... For the um, war industry. Yeah, for the war industry, the, the, these wounded uh, American soldiers. And that was the kickoff to his uh, chair production. And design became uh, spread. You know, we weren't really separating uh, these before. There were carpenters, there were craftsmen, and there were artists. But designers came much later. But there is something, just within the world, as you're talking about, like, uh, art is. Uh, compared to a design, that can be so many things. It can be a, a verb, you're designing, uh, mm. or you, it can be a style. Like art is just an umbrella for you. Either you don't do arting, you do sculpture, or you paint, or you uh, make an installation. And there's a little something in there as well, I would say, uh, in uh, talking about uh, the process and, and the value of a word. Is it, is it um, this discussion? Uh, is it art or is it design? Is it, is it only in the kind of the, the field of, of the, the visual visual arts? Because, I mean, you go to a restaurant, some restaurants, the chefs are artists, really, but you can still eat the food. And some some chefs are more like designers because it's, it's practical. But you don't say, I'm going to go and have an art dinner tonight and I might have a design dinner tomorrow. And, um, you know, tennis players, great sports people, athletes are, are kind of artists in a way, but... You don't go to an art tennis match where it's all about the movements because <laughs> they just want to win, right? Uh -huh. why, why in what we do is that we've got this kind of obsession about the difference or the similarities between them? Restraints is maybe one of the keys for designers. There has to be some kind of limitation, whether uh, I guess in every artist's case the idea comes first, and for, for a designer, well, you can say against me, uh, maybe the, the, the problem comes first and then you start to have your ideas of how to solve it. Mm. Or, uh, well, you can also, like the commercial, <laughs> you can create the problem, yes, because mm. you are creative, and then you solve it yourself mm. and y you have that. But I guess that design is more about restraints. Uh, yes, I uh, agree in one way, but uh, a lot of designers, me myself, sometimes kind of start with material and, and then see, okay, this is uh, manipulated like in this way, uh, uh, then this happened, and then, okay, maybe I'm going to find a function where in context I can use it, this, uh, this approach. In. Uh, so in, in that sense, you apply even if you don't start with the function, you apply it later in the, in the mm. stage. So I agree with you in that sense. And you were talking about like having a function, but sometimes the function could be emotional or be making uh, a, a, perfor a performance. It doesn't need to be this technical function. Uh, I think maybe lies in open up the word of function. I would compare it to, if you look at the Scandinavian design, uh, if you go back 20 years, it was really minimalistic. Then uh, the world has gone global and all the designers of the world reads the same magazines, the same blogs. Uh, and uh, uh, suddenly something happened with the Scandinavian design and it gets more uh, facet uh, like faceted. It's, uh, it's so much more interesting in a way is my thought that the young generation open up everything. And I think it's the same with the art scene that uh, the globalization makes it uh, a lot of thing happens. And for me as a designer, I use the art to develop myself. I have done art pieces, but I still call me as a designer. It's, uh, I have in the 
Central Hospital of Karlstad artworks, for example, but I'm a designer still. Uh, and uh, uh, I used to say that when I do art, uh, I get better in the end on my design work because I experiment there and try out things that I never would have tried otherwise. And in the end, my commercial side, if, that I call it, it gets better. So uh, that's what I think will happen more and more, that our businesses grow together and it's kind of uninteresting. And if I'm called me an artist or a designer, it's, it's something happening out there. So We've talked about William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. Um, we, we've, um, th there, there have been times, lots of times in history where creators from different disciplines have contributed to, this, to a movement, like you think about the Stiel, you think about um, Art Deco, those kind of movements. Is, it, is there a similar movement happening now, or is there one emerging where, regardless of, and, you know, and also in some of the, you know, the, the early modernists and the, you know, Picasso and his era, where even musicians and, and dancers all became part of the same whirlwind of culture. Is something like that happening now, do you think? Is there any movement that brings people from different disciplines together in pursuit of a common aesthetic or um, idealism or something like that? My feeling is that I have, have, a, I have an 18-year-old at home who is now um, about to graduate and he wants to go into what he expresses as the creative world. And then I ask him, okay, but could you be more specific? Are you, what, do you want to be an architect? Do you want to be a painter? Do you want to be a designer? Do you want to, want to be a graphic designer? And he's like, that's the most stupid, old-fashioned question I ever heard, because Mom, it's, not about, <laughs> it's not about you know, choosing one or the other. It's all a meltdown. And it may be at, in your time, you know, back in the... <laughs> Uh, the old, the old days, as my <laughs> kids say. <Yeah. laughs> but but it, this is true. And, and, uh, and uh, according to his friends, because we were gathered, you know, a lot of them around the table, they talk about this creative non-borders in a, in a way that is, for me, new. So, yes, I think something is changing. Uh, it, it is not maybe so important for the coming generation whether you're an industrial designer or whether you're an artist, because you can work in these different fields. Uh, another difference, perhaps, between art and design is the way people respond to it. Do you act differently in the presence of art and the presence of design? Is that another thing that should be on our, lift, on our list? Not lift, list. The way that we respond to one or the other. Yeah, I think you are correct. I remember... A couple of years ago, me and my wife and our youngest son were at one of the art museums in Denmark. And he, like one and a half year old, running around. And suddenly he's like this close to flip over a statue of something. And I was com completely afraid. And then some time later, we are in the restaurant and then a chair is falling. So, of course, uh, but that's, again, it's the value. Like, when you see that statue, you realize that you will have a big <laughs> problem. So, we're back to statue. price, really. <laughs> yeah. Back to, like, insurance <laughs> policy. Yes. <laughs> Petter, Lee, do you have a, a, a response to that about the, the way that these art or design make you feel? Yeah, th I think so. Yeah, definitely. And I also s noticed that the audience nodding when, when you ask that question. Uh, it's also about how things are exposed. Uh, if you're tiptoeing around them and you're, you know, you're taught to have your hands on your back and uh, look at the art that way, of course, that is in your um, spine, I guess. Um, and useful everyday tools, things, design items, chairs, um, Maybe th no, they they wouldn't you know gain that respect. But if you put a, a Alexander Lervik or a Mark Nusen uh, one-off piece with a spotlight on it, then people will you know walk around. So um, it's a matter of maybe how you expose it and how you package and conceptualize things. I guess. So presentation as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. We're um, out of time for the discussion. I think we should um, throw it open to questions from the audience. If the definition of art and design lies within the hands of the creator, kind of, uh, what do you intend it to be? Then 
art can always be design and design can always be art, but I'm not really 100% sure about it, in a sense. If you present art as design, uh, I think there's some like vital parts that's missing, making it design. But how do you, what's your take on that? Like if we would take your shitty chair and put it as chairs here, for example, uh -huh. would it be design then or would it be art still? Be just really? annoying, wouldn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> really? No, but uh, if I sat here tonight and said that that is a chair, a chair, of course it would be a chair then. Uh, and uh, uh, but I, in the end, I think it's like the viewer of an object that decides it. Because uh, if you look at my shitty chair and think that wow, what a chair, then it is a chair. But uh, if you think it's art, I think then it's art. So that's, uh, this is a tricky line to decide, but uh, in the end, I, it's, it's your decision. If you as a designer kind of move towards to art, if it's not, if you do, it, do that because of the reason of not really engaging with the essence of, of designing and instead of like, okay, so it can be challenging and, and make it for production and all those things. And then if you unwanted move into art because okay, it's, it's easy to call it art because it doesn't work as a de de design in terms of function you talked about. Uh, I think it's a risk with that. And I, sometimes you, you can sense, uh, especially when you just, just graduated and making your things, okay, well, I, I work forward for art and gallery pieces because it's just easy to make, because I don't, don't think to engage so much. A question, yes. My idea is that what really defines like design or separates design from the art is the quantity, probably, because the art piece is a, a unique piece. Even if it's like a limited edition, it can be like five, 10, or like, but still limited. And the design piece is made for mass production. And uh, probably in the time then it becomes an art piece when it's like already very few left, like for example, um, Charlotte Perrian chair or Chinese art vase, which was an um, object to use before, and now it's an art piece in the museums. So do you think that the quantity has to define the art and design? So that's another one for our checklist, isn't it? Rarity. Well, I, um, that I was exposed to very much when I was starting to work in the auction industry, when, when you ha handle the second-hand market. And uh, one of the first things that the older experts told me that was, look for the unique pieces, because they are more interesting. Um, then I, I uh, recognize also that that is not, the, the answer is not as easy as that. Uh, I guess that some designs that still it was made in a, in a larger scale can be also regarded as art already. Um, I'm looking at the gentleman beside you because I'm thinking of Marta Mos Fjetterström, who was uh, a designer with, working with carpets. And, and of course, this is maybe it was, well, she said, put the art on the floor. <laughs> but still, it's carpets useful design objects. Uh, today, 100 years later, we regard them almost as art pieces and we hang them on the wall. And they, they are still in production. You can order the same carpets with the same patterns from the, f from the same, uh, well, not factory, but, but from the same place in, in Skåne. Unique pieces are very sought after, for sure. But it's not necessarily that those made in larger series will be less uh, desirable. So, um, well, we haven't got the, the, the final answer to this yet, because maybe we need an, another 100 or 200 years. I'm going to call it a day. Thank you very much. You've been a, an amazing and very interesting and entertaining audience. Thanks for the, the, the panel. Uh, thanks for Aritco and to the museum for hosting us. And now, please, everybody, go and destroy a paper airplane, because <laughs> it's not art. Mm -hmm.